Capital Queers, Alex Reynolds Mystery, Book 3, author Fred Hunter, publisher St. Martin's Press, New York, 1999, narrator Eric Ost. Chapter 4. We found Ryan and Peter in the living room, watching headline news on CNN. The look of abject grief that Ryan had worn since the murder had begun to give way to a more doe-in-the-headlights kind of blankness. Mother greeted Ryan with a sympathetic, "'How are you doing, lovey?' Then went on to explain that his apartment was all clean and tidy. She made it sound quite ordinary, as if we'd just gone over and picked up after a party. The British have an unerring habit of finding trauma with a bravara show of normalcy. Whatever her intention, she served to distract him as I passed through the room with the box under my arm. I stashed the box beneath the staircase to the basement. Later in the afternoon, Mother requested Ryan's help in the kitchen, giving Peter and me a much-needed break all alone together, which we spent by going for a walk. The streets had the late afternoon bustle of suited people heading home from work. Despite the traffic, Peter and I held hands as we walked, something that we and our brothers and sisters under the skin are usually loath to do in public, but I didn't care. I was sad and more than a little scared. Losing somebody nearby always makes you afraid that you'll lose someone closer. I held Peter's hand more tightly. Neither of us spoke. When we returned home, we found Mother busily whipping up a bowl of trifle as she nattered away at Ryan. His expression had become even more vacant. He looked like he was slipping away while Mother fought to keep him in the present with a steady stream of innocuous conversation. All during dinner, a million thoughts were buzzing around in my head like pesky gnats. Foremost was the idea that the police probably really would stick to Ryan as the most obvious suspect. And if that were the case, it would be up to my little team of spies, namely my mother and my husband, to try to track down the real murderer. When we were just about through with dinner, I decided there was no time like the present to start asking some questions, especially since the silence around the table was beginning to get on my nerves. Ryan, did anything happen since we saw you last? Peter looked up from his plate, and Mother shot an annoyed glance at me. Uh-huh, said Ryan dully. What do you mean? Well, I was just wondering about Mason. You know, that I've known him for a lot of years, and I don't know of anyone who didn't like him. Ryan looked down at his plate for a few seconds. I, I guess we all have enemies. This surprised me. Did Mason? He looked up. There were people who didn't like him, like a couple of my old friends. You know how it is when you pair off. Not everyone likes your spouse or understands why you... But I don't think anybody hated him. I see. That's why I was wondering if anything out of the ordinary happened since you had us over. Ryan twisted his baseball cap absently in his right hand. He looked as if he was trying to read a street sign through a fog. No, nothing. I was disappointed. I don't know what I expected, but I really did think that Ryan might unknowingly hold some clue to what had happened. Assuming, of course, that it wasn't the obvious, as Mother had suggested earlier, and someone had just broken in to rob the place and killed Mason in the process. Mother and Peter unobtrusively cleared the dinner plates, and Mother brought in a tray of small dessert bowls full of trifle, which... She distributed amongst us, while I continued to question Ryan. What did you do all week? I worked. What about Mason? Ryan shrugged. He stayed home. He did the normal stuff. I don't know. I glanced at Mother, and though her expression hadn't entirely lost their disapproving edge, it was now tinged with interest. I said... So nothing unusual happened since we were over for dinner? No. I let that lie there for a moment or two, then said, Ryan, was there anything unusual about the dolls? His face relaxed for a second, as if he was glad to be talking about something that was so dear to Mason. All their dolls were unusual, you know that. Y yeah, 
I just wondered because it's so odd that the dolls were broken the way they were. It was a nasty thing to do, he replied warmly, angry on Mason's behalf. I know, and it's the oddest thing about his murder. I didn't bother to add besides his being eviscerated. Peter glanced at me for a moment as if he was afraid I would. Was there anything out of the ordinary about the new doll? Ryan stopped in the act of moving his dessert around with his spoon. He wasn't exactly eating anything and raised his hand slowly to look at me. The new one? Yeah. Was there anything unusual about it? The There was a flicker of something across his face. If I had to guess, I'd say he just realized something that hadn't occurred to him before. Both Mother and Peter had stopped eating and were watching him, apparently as interested as I was. No, there was nothing strange about it. Are you sure? Of course I am, he replied, his tone a little testy. With an attempt at regaining his normal manner, he said, There was nothing. Mm, he did take it to Marshall to be appraised. Marshall was Marshall Torkelson, a mutual acquaintance of ours who owned an antique shop. Though the doll in question wasn't an antique, Marshall did know enough to offer an educated opinion on such things. To be appraised, Peter said. He just bought it. He knew how much it was worth. There was a slight pause during which Ryan stared at Peter. I got the feeling he was debating with himself how to answer. Yes, he often did that. I don't know why. Where did you buy it? Why, we were in Washington at a store, a, a specialty store. A little shop on Wisconsin Avenue in Georgetown. Just dolls and doll houses, that sort of thing. An abbreviated smile. Both touching and rueful lit the corners of his mouth. The type of place Mason loved, just like you'd imagine. He thought he'd died and gone to heaven. The smile disappeared. After a moment's silence, Ryan looked at me out of the corner of his eye. I could have sworn there was something cagey in his manner, but frankly, he was such a mess at the moment, it would have been difficult to judge anything he did in normal terms. Was it broken? Ryan asked. What? said Peter, his forehead wrinkling. His new doll. Was it broken? I glanced at Peter, who seemed as perplexed by the question as I was. It occurred to me and that, having been the last one that Mason had purchased, it might have some special significance for Ryan. I'm afraid so, I said. It was pretty much smashed. Oh, he said sadly. At least I thought it was sadly. After a moment, he said, and did you clean all of them up? Uh, the dolls, I mean. Oh, yes, we did, said Mother. Uh, what did you do with them? This time Mother looked toward me. From her expression, I gathered she thought this was a normal question from a grieving person. The majority of them were smashed, I explained. We swept up all the debris and threw it away. Mm, okay, he said. That's good. The rest of them I brought here. I didn't know whether or not you wanted to see them. But they're here if you want them. No, he said. I don't want them. There was the slightest emphasis on the word them, which gave me the uncomfortable feeling that he wanted to keep the broken ones. Though why he would do that was way beyond me. We finished the rest of our desserts in silence. There didn't seem to be anything else to ask Brian, and even if I could have thought of something... It didn't seem the time to push him any further, and we'd pretty much exhausted our ability for a small talk. I was still puzzled by his reaction when I asked him about the dom. It gave me the uneasy feeling that Ryan, who was perhaps the most open person I'd known, was keeping something from us. When he finished the last spoonful of trifle, he laid his spoon quietly on the table and sat up for a few moments without saying anything. Finally, without looking up, he said, I think it's time to go home. I glanced at Mother, and she looked honestly surprised. She said, Oh, darling, you don't have to do that. Don't you think you'd be better off staying here a couple of days? You're more than welcome, and we plenty of broom. 
He looked at her, his face completely devoid of expression. No, it's time for me to go. I appreciate your... I appreciate everything you've done, but I want to be at home. Mother looked as if she doubted the wisdom of this decision, but she didn't say anything. Ryan lingered with us for a while over the dinner table, making small talk about when he'd go back to work and other things that really don't seem to matter when someone has died, but there was a sense that he was anxious to go. When he rose to leave, I went to the guest room and retrieved the Raggedy Ann doll for him, which he accepted with a slight blush. But his embarrassment couldn't hide the fact that he'd never part with the thing. Mother stopped him at the last minute and reminded him that he was forgetting their dog. We all looked down at the purebred mutt, which was looking up at Ryan with a slightly cocked head as if he would fully accept any command, but wished his co-master would make up his mind. Ryan looked at Mother and said, Would you mind keeping him for a few days? While I... While I... His voice trailed off. Mother said, Of course we will. You just let me know when you want him back, and one of us will bring him over. Uh, thanks, he said with a curious look at the dog. As he started down the walk, Mother called after him. I'll call you tomorrow to make sure you're all right. He waved to her limply, and as he disappeared down the street, Why on earth doesn't he want Muffin with him? Mother asked incredulously as Peter closed the door. I don't know, except that it really belonged to Mason. Maybe he doesn't want the reminder right now. Mother bent down and stroked the dog's head. I must say I would think he'd want his doggy with him. It was the first glimmer that she too thought that Ryan was acting peculiar, even for someone in shock. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.